And this just happened just moments ago on the Senate floor. The pundits say that compromise is the, the mark of an enlightened person. We're trying to compromise. I just offered to pass the leader's bill. I've offered to work with them. I'm from the Tea Party. They say we won't compromise. I'm willing to raise the debt ceiling. All right, that was freshman Rand Paul. Immediately after he failed to get unanimous consent to tack on a balanced budget amendment to the Reed bill, he says he would have voted to raise a debt ceiling if his amendment, if that amendment was included. Paul is a Tea Party favorite, as we know, and he's rejected not just Harry Reid's plan in the Senate, but also Speaker Boehner's plan from the House. And there you see him right there. He's joining us now from the Senate office building. Thank you so much. I know that you're very busy. You guys have a lot going on. At this point, though, and can, and, and can, we, can we do this? Let's do this interview without talking points, okay? Let's just talk to each other. Both Democrats and Republicans are pointing fingers at you. So I guess maybe the best question to start with is what will make you and the Tea Party happy at this point? Well, the interesting thing is, I mean, in your lead-in, you say that I rejected both plans. I've actually accepted both plans as long as they have an amendment to them that says that we gradually balance the budget over a seven- to eight-year period. I think that's a very reasonable position. It's supported by 75 percent of the American people. And what I but don't how did, how did you hang on? How did you vote on, the, on those plans? Well, on the Reed plan, we haven't voted on it yet. On the cut, cap, and balance, which has had the most votes of any uh, bill that's but passed But on the so Boehner far, plan, how did you vote? On the uh, one that's gotten the most votes out of the House, we had 234 votes, and we had Republicans and Democrats. I voted for that plan. On the Boehner plan, I voted no because it did not balance the budget before we raised the debt ceiling. So many times up here, we haven't really abided by our own rules, and I don't really trust the institution to abide by its rules. Okay. Well, let's talk about, let's talk about the American people, and I'm sure you have to know this, um, that the American people are, for the most part, except for the extremes, except for the, one, the people who are really far left and those who are really far right, most people in the middle want some sort of compromise, and they feel that you guys should have gotten to that way before this point. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, but compromise means both sides give in. For example, our side, the Tea Party and the Conservatives, don't think we should be adding more debt. We don't believe in uh, spending financed by debt. But we've been willing to give in and give. The president wants over $2 trillion in debt to be added, and he wants this to get through the election so he has time to fundraise and to campaign. And we've been willing to give him that. But what we want in return is a seven- to eight-year plan to balance the budget. That's what our country needs. And I won't vote for a deal just because it's a deal. I want a solution for our country, and I think our country's more important than any deal or scheme that might be hatched. Okay, listen, the Democrats have made many concessions when it comes uh, to, to what's going on here. And, and even, even the Tea Party position, it, it appears to mo most people, remains rigid. The question is, have you made your point, and are, by continuing to go on with this, are, do you feel like you're overreaching and you're going to lose the clout and really the respect that you've gotten because I mean, you've really made your point here and then most people will say you've done a good job at it. Do you feel like you're overreaching right now? Well, I guess the thing is is that we have 14 trillion dollars in debt and the Boehner plan and the Reed plan and whatever the mixture of the two will become will add about seven to eight trillion dollars over the next ten years. I think what's interesting here is that people have talked about Moody's and S&P downgrading Okay, our hang on, hang on. Can, can we just stick to that? We're going to get to that, but well, hang on. Let's stick, let's stick to the... There, hold on, please, be respectful talk, here. Let me finish my thought. Can you answer oh, the question, finish. and we'll talk about well, Moody's and all of that. Uh, I want to ask you, to do you feel like... You've interrupted do you my feel answer. like that if you answer the question, I'll give you plenty of time. Do you feel like you have made your point, and now... Do you think people are going to think that you're overreaching and that maybe well, you're going to ru ruin the clout that you already have and yeah, the respect that I, you've gotten? Well, here, here's the problem is that I'm not trying to make a point. I'm trying to do what's best for the country and adding seven to eight trillion dollars of debt over the next ten years I don't think is good for the country. Okay. Now continue on. You were talking about Moody's and, and, uh, and our my, credit my point is, My point is, is that it's not really just about August 2nd. Many of the rating agencies are now saying, even if we raise the debt ceiling, which I think we will do, that we still may be downgraded. But we're being downgraded for our long-term behavior, not our short-term behavior. We're struggling in an economy. We have an economy that's barely growing. Many people say that our debt is a burden on the economy and costing us about a million jobs a year. 
Those are the things that need to change. We need growth in the economy again, but we won't get that until we get a handle on our debt. So I think we need some kind of rule that says simply, and I think it's very reasonable that we balance our budget very gradually over seven to eight years. And I don't think that's too much to ask. If you have been criticized here, as I said, by both sides, and maybe the answer to this question is both sides are to blame, but if the U.S. does default, do you think who will be to blame here? Will it be the president? Will it be the Democrats? Will it be the Tea Party? Republicans? Who's going to be to blame here? I think all along the president should have taken default off the table. In fact, we have legislation that would require him to pay the interest on the debt, require him to pay Social Security checks, and require him to pay the soldiers' salaries. So we've never been for default or reneging on any checks. The president has put that on a table in a grand, elaborate game of chicken. We've always been opposed to that. We think he should reassure, reassure the markets okay. and that there's Mr. plenty Paul, of tax. I'm going to ask, you, I'm gonna ask you again. I just, just the simple answer to my question. If we indeed default, who's going to be to blame, do you feel? I don't think we should default, but if we do, I would say it's the president's fault for not reassuring the markets that he will pay the interest. And actually, privately, he is reassuring the markets, but publicly, he's still playing this game of chicken. But we have plenty of tax revenue to pay the interest okay. on our debt. There's no reason to default. I appreciate you taking the time, and I just want simple answers because, listen, you should know that the public is really frustrated right now, and they don't know what's going on. They don't understand why we haven't come to some sort of consensus, or you guys haven't come to some sort of cons consensus, and they want some answers. You understand that. Is that do, are you feeling that in Washington right now? Well, you know, we've been continuing to offer compromises. About 30 minutes ago, I was on the floor, and I offered to vote for the Reed bill. So while many in the media... But hang on, hang on one second it, again. Well, again. You're, in the you're in the middle of my answer. I know, but I'm asking me. you to answer the well, question. The I don't I'm, want talking well, points. With all due respect, well, I'm was, asking you, do you feel <laughs> the public sentiment point. in Washington? <laughs> This isn't a talking point. I'm trying to tell you what we did 30 minutes ago in the floor. I'm not asking That's you not what you did, point. sir. With all due respect, I'm asking you if you feel how the public feels in Washington. You don't have to tell me what you did, but are you feeling? Do you understand how people feel about this? We feel that they want compromise, and I'm trying to tell you that we're still trying to compromise, and many in the media are trying to depict us as not, but the only way I can prove to you that we're trying to compromise is by telling you we've offered up on the floor another chance to compromise. I've said I'll vote for the Reed bill. I'll vote for the entire $2 trillion that the president wants so he can avoid talking about this during his campaigning. Okay. But the thing is, is that is a, that isn't an offer to compromise, and it is me hearing the American people that they do want to compromise. Okay, so you you are feeling, you are hearing the American people, you feel. Yes? I, I think I've answered the question. I think we're having maybe some trouble understanding each other. But yeah, I have answered the question. I do understand the Americans want us to find a compromise, and I've offered to compromise. I've offered to vote for the Democrat plan if they'll agree to balance the budget gradually over okay. a seven to eight year period. All right, thank you, uh, Rand Paul, we appreciate it. You guys, get back to work because the American people, we want something done, the people who sent you there. Thank you very much, I appreciate you coming on. Now, I wanna let you know,